two, one. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, and welcome to another VR download special, the second this week, because it's a really, really, really busy week. Uh, today, we are here to talk to you about all the latest news from ViveCon, that is HTC's uh, virtual event, which is actually going on right now, uh, but they set embargoes for the start of the show, so we don't even need to watch it. We can just come in and talk about it while they're talking about it. I am your host, Jamie. Uh, I'm switching out today after uh, yesterday's PSVR reveals, which I'm, if you haven't seen, uh, go check out uploadvr.com. We've got some really cool exclusive coverage on that right now. But I am joined today by two wonderfully technical fellows uh, sitting sitting to my immediate left is none other than Ian Hamilton. Hello, Say hello Ian, Ian Hamilton here. I, I, whoa, my hands disappeared. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, hope you... That's very drunk. Yeah, it's weird here. when your hands just suddenly, like, you know they're there, but you can't see them now they're here. Okay. Mm. Thank you for joining us. I'm Ian Hamilton. Yes. I'm David Heaney, and I write about the technology behind VR. And based on these introductions, you can tell that maybe one of us is on mushrooms right now, but who knows which one it is. <laughs> Gentlemen, it's a busy day in the VR industry yet again. HTC has announced the Vive Pro 2 and the Vive Focus 3, two very, very different headsets. Uh, we're going to talk about both of them over the course of the next hour or so. Uh, we've got them up on Stevie the TV right now, as you can see. Uh, and as you can probably tell just from these images, the uh, Vive Pro 2 is kind of a continuation of, I guess, what you'd call like the flagship uh, mainline line of Vive headsets now. This is the second enhanced, or really it's the third enhanced Pro headset. Uh, and that's for PC VR. And then we have the Focus 3, which is HTC's new standalone. Um, now, again, they're both very different headsets. The Pro 2 is going to be sold to both consumers and enterprise, whereas the Focus 3 is uh, going to be sold mainly to enterprise. Um, just going to run down the specs before we get into the conversation. Uh, correct me if I've got any of this wrong, but I think I've written my notes down right. The Pro 2 is a Steam VR tracked headset with an LCD panel uh, that delivers basically 2.5K per eye resolution, which they say combined delivers 5K resolution, um, which is pretty much the highest uh, of like the kind of... I don't, I don't want to say mainstream, but main headsets out there right now. I mean, there are some other like less well-known solutions that might beat it, but of the main contenders, that, that's probably the highest right now. Uh, the field of view is 120 degrees, uh, thanks to a new dual-stacked lens design that they talked about, uh, and there's a refresh rate of 120 hertz. Uh, the Vive Pro 2 is going to be sold first off as a headset only, like they did with the original Vive Pro. Um, and that will cost $749. That doesn't come with anything other than just the headset, and it's seen as like an upgrade for if you already own any kind of other Steam VR bits and bobs. And then we also have the, the full thing being sold in August for a rather staggering $1,399 US dollars. Uh, before we get into uh, discussion, let's just quickly run down the Focus Free as well. So this is, like I said before, a standalone headset. It's actually quite comparable to the Pro 2 in terms of kind of optics and things like that. So it's the same 2.5K per eye uh, resolution, same 120 degree field of view, except that this time the refresh rate is 90 Hertz. Uh, it's not using SteamVR because obviously it's a, a standalone headset. So it's using a new uh, inside out tracking sim uh, system with four cameras uh, located on the corners of the front of the headset. Uh, to go with that, there are new Oculus touch light controllers. Uh, it's made out of a Magnesium alloy frame, uh, and it has a swappable battery right at the back of the headset. Um, that's being sold, again, mainly to the enterprise market. They did say that they'll sell it on some consumer channels, but expect all the software in there to be kind of aimed at the enterprise market. Don't expect any games or anything like that. And that costs $1,300. There's a heck of a lot of stuff going on there. Guys, just... Uh, Hearing all of that, and obviously we've we've known some of this information for quite a while now under embargo. What are your immediate reactions to today's announcements? It's expensive. I, I kind of <laughs> tune out when I start hearing the prices. I kind of tune out a lot of the other information because it it really you used it the term yesterday, uh, but it, it kind of like sets a threshold that how far 
they can actually reach with the hardware as soon as you hear that price. And I don't know, it's it's expensive is my takeaway from it all. So I think while Focus 3 obviously is expensive, a lot of people I've seen are contrasting it to the $300 consumer Quest price. And it's important to note that the Quest 2 for Enterprise is actually $800. So this does come into the same price range roughly when you're mm -hmm. talking about a business ordering a lot of these in quantity. So I actually thought the, the Vibe Focus 3 seems like a compelling piece of hardware to me. And the fact that HTC is providing this first party software, whereas Facebook, it's mostly leaving it down to third party fragmented solutions. I think that's actually going to be quite compelling for some businesses that want as a little hassle as possible to get into VR. Yeah. Um, lots of different elements to talk about then. Um, one of the whole, one of the biggest elements of both headsets is going to be that jump to what they call, you know, 5k, uh, resolution in, in their own words that puts it, uh, above obviously the Oculus Quest 2 that puts it above the specs we revealed for the PSVR 2 yesterday. Uh, and that puts it above even the HP reverb G2, right? Like it by some way, am I right in saying that? Like I'm, I'm not great at the minutiae of this stuff. Yeah, it's the resolution here is very significant. This is, as you said at the start, the highest resolution headset on the consumer market. The only place you will find a higher resolution headset is in things like the Varjo headset series, where, where it has a focal display in the middle that's much higher resolution. There are some other enterprise ones, but but generally, if we're talking about the less than two thousand dollar range, there is nothing that is as high resolution as this headset. It really does break ground in resolution. Yeah. Mm. I, so the last time I really used a Vive headset for an extended period of time was the Vive Pro and uh, had the wireless adapter, Vive wireless adapter with it. And that was an impressive, I mean, it was a good system uh, for its time. And I, I think when I reviewed it, it was probably late 2018. And I, I called it like the best VR of 2018 being too expensive. Um, the problem I had there with it is like, you don't move your PC around very often. Even if you've got a desktop PC, it usually stays in one place. But maybe once or twice a month, you you might move it uh, from one side of your desk to the other side of the desk, or you might reach behind it and uh, move everything around to redo the USB wires because you might put a new wire in it. Um, and even doing that little once or twice a month sort of like adjustment to your desktop PC location is enough to be annoying when you've got the wireless adapters broadcasting antenna sort of connected and you have to find a new spot for the antenna. Um, yeah. Most people out there who have like a dedicated Vive room, if you've got a dedicated like room for your VR, that's not an issue. There are a lot of people this isn't an issue for, but like when you're talking about mass consumers and getting out to millions of people, those types of things of like having to reposition an antenna are the things that sort of add up over time. And the battery pack would get hot and uh, all those things. I, I, Mahini and I, right before we were coming in here, I was trying to sort of get the math down on how expensive it is to get like the end all be all best experience you can get out of VR today. And you can add, uh, did, did we confirm whether the Vive wireless adapter works with Vive Pro 2? Uh, yeah. Like not explicitly, but they've told me in their own words that all their old stuff could work. So like the lip tracker that they've just announced, the mm. three point trackers. I I assume that that is included in all of that because it is essentially the same ergonomics um, as the original Pro as well. So in terms of that, it shouldn't be an issue. I don't think. So there's a pathway here with like HTC hardware to getting a wireless PC experience, a lip tracker. You could get the original Vive Pro with the eye uh, tracker inside of it. And then you could attach uh, Vive trackers to your feet and your hips for full body tracking. And when you've got that whole system set up, eye tracking, lip tracking, feet tracking, hip tracking, you have fully immersed, you're totally in VR, your entire body is in there and you could have a really great experience in what like three apps that will really support that kind of experience and for a very small percentage of people just a ridiculously small group of people 
they'll be willing to spend two grand, three grand uh, when you add the PC in there to have that kind of quality experience. And the thing that we chase is like, uh, the, the thing that Facebook has been chasing and then we've been chasing is like the people who are trying to report this to the masses is how do you do all those things at a lower price? How do you do like, that's what I'm really curious to see what Apple does when it comes out with uh, whatever products it does is how many of those things that I just described is Apple going to be able to push into a, a device that's going to be probably priced expensive but i don't know that they're going to be more expensive than htc's products mm. yeah i it's interesting it, it seems like this is the time around now is the time every year uh especially in the past two years that we get the big update from htc it used to be the ces conference but they've kind of uh stopped doing that the past couple of years and so every time this kind of year is uh it's when we start thinking oh is this the time htc brings a proper competitor on the consumer front right and this time last year was when they announced like they were finally properly rolling out uh updates for the cosmos that included the cosmos elite which they're still selling and is uh selling for i think it's like a at 900 dollars now is it or is it, was it maybe a thousand one of one of the two but i think it's 900 um and then also they were, they were announcing then a, a Cosmos Play, they called it, which was meant to be a $400 uh, alternative that only had four camera tracking. And that, uh, again, it was just a PC device, but that seemed like the most ambitious uh, consumer play HTC had done yet. And I think we were just, I was just talking about this on Twitter, just leading into the uh, show here. Like, they, yes, HTC communicated that these are enterprise products beforehand but they didn't necessarily they weren't as necessarily as loud about that as they could have been and you know they they did a whole kind of twitter meme campaign uh and they were kind of like responding to youtubers and everything like that in very jokey ways which i think didn't help them in terms of expectations here really but it's 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 interesting because you you go back to what you were just saying just now ian there are going to be people out there where, you know, one thousand four hundred dollars is not an issue. They will pay that very, very gladly. And at the end of the day, those people likely already have either a Vive or an Index or a Vive Pro anyway. So it's actually seven hundred and forty-nine dollars. Um, and I think that's interesting because we saw so much interest around the Reverb G two uh, at the end of last year. Uh, which is a really, really great headset, really great resolution, but was completely let down by the controllers, right? So for me, the exciting thing about this whole setup, and uh, granted that to get the whole setup, it is more than the price of the G2. Um, the thing that's really exciting for me is to bring even better optics back to Steam VR tracking and to get to go back and once again, look at all those like classic Steam VR apps like Skyrim and Google Earth and everything like that. Um, do you think, Hini, do you think there's going to be a big market for that, especially with, you know, Reverb G2 only being like six months old and Index, you know, being maybe like a year or two old at this point? Yeah, I think if you look at, as you mentioned, their Cosmos Play last year, that they tried to go for this kind of lower price consumer market. But the problem is, people that are PC gamers specifically, they really don't want to accept anything less than near perfect tracking. If you can notice a tracking problem in this issue, the reputation that that's going to give the product will just cause a kind of downward spiral. And HTC obviously noticed that the only version that was selling, if you look at the Steam hardware survey, was that Cosmos Elite. So I mm. almost see this, this Pro 2 as a successor to the Cosmos Elite more than anything, where they said, okay, we've tried this play with Inside Out, People don't want it because we can't deliver on the premium experience that they want, but they are buying this kind of kit bash we've put together. So let's actually go double down on that and, and go for that market specifically. Yeah, it definitely does seem, well, I was just going to say, it definitely seems reactionary in that sense. Sorry, Ian, you go, you go for it. Oh, just mentioning Guy, Guy in the comments here. So took a shot every time they said business during the keynote, being drunk <laughs> at 10 a.m. was a bad idea. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
I mean, I was I was surprised that I did the I did a briefing with them last week, and I was surprised when they mentioned that Pro Two uh, would be pitched towards that kind of high end consumer use as well. Because again, so much of their messaging the past couple of years has been pivoting Pro away from consumer and over to enterprise, especially with the you know the Vibe Pro I as well. Um, let's let's table uh, Pro Two for now and and, and look at Focus Three. I, we're talking about the Cosmos a bit. We're talking a bit about the inside tracking there. And that really was a problem for the Cosmos. We reviewed the uh, original six camera solution uh, again, I think like maybe two years ago now. Um, and that had subpar tracking compared to other solutions on the on the market at that point in time. Is it is it possible that, you know, with four cameras now, um, new controllers... Uh, and obviously this different form factor and obviously the work they've done with, I think it was a, it's a different, uh, entirely different type of tracking solution on the Focus Plus. But is it possible now with the Focus 3, they've got it rock solid and we'll see a big improvement with this device? I think there could be, yes, because, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, he, you know, Hina's got some real thoughts here, I'm sure to, to, to share on sort of tracking quality, but like the the software, they they don't, HTC doesn't have the resources to match the software sort of speed of upgrade that we're seeing out of the Quest and, and Facebook mm -hmm. system. And yes, it'll probably be improved, and Heaney will explain like how how HTC gets its tracking tech and improves it and builds on it. But I think it's one of these things where uh, you it's such a missing piece that no one without lots of people working on it can really match what Facebook is doing to improve their tracking quality. Yeah, I think if you look at what they have here, though, they have the full power of the XR2 chip on board. Mm. There is going to be kind of, we've heard from HTC, we were expecting that they would license Qualcomm's, but in your conversation with them, Jamie, HTC seemed to indicate that this actually is their own tracking software this time. But that doesn't mean that they're writing everything themselves down to the very lowest level. There are going to be kind of frameworks and libraries and and things you can get from the XR2 chip that will make it much, much easier to build upon. Because in Cosmos, they have to kind of balance how much data they can send across a USB to the PC and make sure that that can be managed. On the previous Focus headsets, they only had a Snapdragon 835. But if you look at the XR2, it has hardware acceleration for a lot of the most common operations that are needed for this sort of tracking. The question is, of course, Given all that still, will there be a good tracking quality? And we won't know that until we get hands on, but there is reason to be optimistic, I would say. Yeah. Sorry, you can should, say something. Should I respond to the people asking about the Sony video? Uh, I see a lot of people talking about it. Uh, yeah. I mean, it'd be weird if we now said no. <laughs> <laughs> no I just, yeah, so uh, what happened here is yesterday we uh, broke this Sony news that we've got some specs out of the new headset. We did a live show here in the studio. Uh, after Shortly after we got out of the studio, I realized there was a typo in our article uh, where I had the wrong dimension listed by 80 pixels, or no, by 40 pixels. And I had used that dimension uh, when we came in here to the studio to talk about it. And uh, what that more or less did was it, it had our pixel count of what was in that display off by uh, a little bit. Uh, it's still a 4K display, uh, but one, you know, getting 40 pixels wrong in one dimension uh, actually adds, adds up to a lot uh, when you give the, pull, the full pixel dimension. So we took that video down, made it private, uh, and uh, we're going to put out a separate video um, that just explains the correct stats. And the article, you go read it now, it's got the correct stats in it. Yeah, yeah. And... Uh... Ian has undergone sufficient punishment, I can assure you, for his mistake, his crime. <laughs> Next time he's in the download, he'll have like a big hat with a D on it and tape over his mouth. And that will yeah. that'll make things right. Um, so yeah, getting back to uh, the Focus 3. Um, one of the things, I got to say, like everything I saw about the Focus 3, and I've done many of these HTC briefings now. I've, you know, the narrative of HTC ever since the vibe has been the headset is always really, really, really expensive. And they kind of get around it with this kind of enterprise uh, angle they do. One of the things I really, really liked about 
focus free is actually kind of the the software approach they're taking with it this time which is there's like a there's like a generalized enterprise app store on the headset so you could feasibly if you think vr is a cool training tool buy just the focus free not necessarily for a specific reason so much as you could put the headset on and there might be apps for training to do speech you know like different kinds of different communication uh, apps and then yeah uh, as uh, i believe one of these is showing this is kind of some of vive's own software that they have i think this is vive sync right Heaney? is this the one or yeah is it? i think this may be an old image but it's vive sync yeah um and i i think that's a really interesting angle that actually probably gives the device a lot more appeal to buy on a whim so much more than it is, you know, these specific partnerships HTC has done uh, over the past few years, right? And I also think that's it's an interesting thing from a kind of ecosystem perspective because, you know, if we want to inevitably talk about a potential consumer version of the Focus uh, down the line, they're kind of getting that store framework in place here in uh, in some ways, right? Mm. Yeah. Any thoughts, Heaney? Yeah, it's. St stand by here two seconds. My connection's yep. dropping. You go ahead then. Yeah, uh, I just I get. Other than business, it's really hard for me to see what HTC's long term path is for for yep. anything but just getting these business customers. And I think HTC is is kind of proving that there is you know the fact that they're still around without really appealing to business without appealing to customers for years now i mean since i joked before we came in here that uh htc finds ways to increase like that's very htc is very creative at finding ways to add price to vr features everyone wants so like yes everyone wants these new things but they don't want them at these higher and higher prices and uh, a swappable battery. That's fantastic. I would love to have a swappable mm. battery. It's such a cool idea, but like uh, I had this very straightforward conversation with uh, my kid where uh, she wanted to know what, what's that new headset that uh, you were talking about on the upload channel. And I said, very plainly, it's very much like a quest Two, except it's a thousand dollars more expensive. Now that's comparing, of course, the consumer price, the three hundred dollars consumer price, to the business price here, where it's not, not fair. You can add quite a bit uh, of price if you want to compare the business license to the business license. But still, for the mass market people out there, if I'm explaining this to everyday people, I'm not going to really necessarily get into the business warranty and explain all that. That the differences of because I don't care. What they care about is what do I get if I go and buy this headset. And um, you're not going to get uh, the same experience if you're as a consumer out of these these HTC headsets that you're going to get out of the, the the Vive ones. So I, yeah, HTC is going to be huge in Asia, and they're going to be huge in the business market. And that's I think the story we're hearing from HTC, and all the software pieces that they've built are to aid in that journey. Mm. Uh, one thing I would say to that point, though, is that there's another interesting story that's kind of timed with this is that is the release of the Pico Neo 3 in China. Um, and they, you know, they announced uh, enterprise models for uh, North America and Europe uh, earlier this week. But they also announced a software lineup for um, the Pico Neo 3, just as it's going to be sold in China. And it's a it's a solid lineup of some of the you know, not not the very very best games, but some really good hits from the Quest library. Um, and we're starting to see. You know, I I asked HTC maybe two years ago why the Focus wasn't a standalone uh, consumer headset, and they just told me at the time, which uh, quite plainly that you know it costs so much to support and build that ecosystem around it. And now I think you fast forward two years later. That that work has kind of been done for them in a sense by um, by Facebook. And if you know if if there was a consumer version of the uh, 
the focus free, it could feasibly run pretty much everything the the quest runs, right? And they could, you know, potentially get some of those games well, not over. And not, not beat saber. Yep, <laughs> that's true. Yeah, well, well, I would like to I would like to track down devs and really corner them. The ones who do release on the Pico and who do release on the Focus Three, are they able to? Uh, support themselves with the funds from those countries and from those headsets or you know is, is it even substantial compared to uh what they can get out of the quest ecosystem because that's really the determining factor if we can if we could write a story that uh you know successful quest devs um released on these headsets and doubled their money or or something like that by releasing on all these headsets that are uh selling in china then i think that would help you know make the case to other devs hey maybe i should go support these headsets but right now mm. we have not heard that from anyone yet that that the devs releasing on these headsets are actually able to, able to substantially add to their money by releasing on these headsets to china and other countries can you hear me again yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just making sure. A bit difficult to stream. My internet can't really handle streaming and being on all the time, but I think it's stable now again. He needs Starlink. Whoever's exactly. making Starlink, I hurry have, up, please. I have Starlink pre-ordered. It should be three months or so until I have it. But yeah, it's, it's one of those things around. where, regardless of the fact that the Neo 2 is selling in South Korea or Japan, what I'd really like to know is what kind of market foothold will it, will it get in those markets? Because if it can get a big following in South Korea and Japan, that's a much easier way to port it because there are kind of barriers to entering the China internal market that not all developers are going to be comfortable with. But the problem is from, as far as we know, the Oculus Quest 2 is selling like hotcakes in South Korea and Japan. Mm. So yeah. I, I, I kind of wonder how Pico is going to compete. But again, you know, what, what I've always tried to say about Pico and what people need to understand is there, there is the reason that this looks so much like Quest 2 is because it essentially is Quest 2. Face the company mm. that Facebook contracts to build Quest 2 owns Pico. So it's very unlikely we'll see Pico be serious competition to Facebook because they are likely very friendly with Facebook through the parent company that actually manufactures the Quest 2. And it's, it's, poten it's potentially likely, although we have no confirmation of any sort of this, that Facebook has some sort of agreement with Pico to stay out of the Western market in exchange for using the design with no issues. Mm. Well, we we haven't seen uh, Facebook take a real stab at China since the version of the Go that went over there, right? With the the was it Xiaomi, was it or Huawei? Uh, yes, yeah, sh one of those two. Xiaomi, Xiaomi, who manufactured the Oculus Go, had their own version of the Go in China, and we actually yep. this was the first time we saw this thing that we're talking about now, where developers uh, convert their game to Chinese language and port it there. And there was the Mi App Store, but of course that was 3DOF VR where you couldn't move around and you didn't have track controllers. So it didn't seem that it got much of a following, but it would be interesting to see Facebook do that again. Although arguably when you think about it, this is quite a similar situation. The company who's manufacturing the headset in the first place in this situation through a subsidiary is selling in China. And yeah. Guy, Guy in the comments, uh, Guy Godin, of course, the developer virtual desktop, for those of you who aren't aware, uh, is in our comments. Uh, so you've got uh, him there commenting uh, along with the rest of you. Um, and he's saying it's much harder to develop apps for the Chinese market, doing support and handling the Chinese firewall. Uh, those are a lot mm -hmm. of added costs and complexity that maybe a lot of developers don't want to deal with. For multiplayer games, it would be a no-go essentially because you would have to use an entirely different networking stack or one of the few that also have servers in China because you know you can't operate a Western business in China without going through some very strict procedures and partnering with a local company there. China is not uh, a kind of a globalist country at all when it comes to entering their market. Um Walking back a bit, just to go back to kind of some of the tech specs, uh, people in the comments have also been asking, you know, how to envision that field of view, that 120 degree field of view um, on both headsets. Uh, and he, I was wondering, A, if you could, you know, rate this on the chart of different uh, fields of views we have out there in different uh, consumer headsets at the moment. And then also if you have um, anything else to share, any insights to share on what they called, uh, where is it in my notes? Like it's the bespoke dual lens design, I believe they call it somewhere. Um, 
if you know if you know anything else more about that because i spoke with them and i wasn't entirely sure <laughs> entirely what they were on about but um yeah if you, those two things yeah i have to say across both of these products the new lens is one of the most exciting things because if you look at the companies that make vr headsets the kind of products and experiences they can deliver is more kind of determined by the lens than a lot of people realize. And Facebook has actually been using the same lens since Oculus Go. The same lens on Oculus Go through Quest, through Rift S, and now in Quest 2. HTC was using its same lens for its first headsets, but we know that they made some minor improvements in the Focus Plus, which is, I guess, in this new naming scheme, the Focus 2. But those, those improvements were apparently around sweet spot. But now we finally see what a lot of people have been hoping for, what I've been hoping for, an increase in field of view. Now, the one thing I would say is this is don't don't think of this as going from 100 to 120 because each company has their own way of quantifying field of view. And the way to think about this is HTC described the previous Vive Pro, Vive and Vive Focus as 110. And so on that same kind of metric, HTC's own metric, this is 120. So we're not talking about a massive increase in field of view, but it is roughly a 10 degrees increase and anything at this point is sort of welcome because Facebook has gone backwards in field of view, and that's what most people see VR through today. Sony obviously, you know, haven't released a headset in a while, and, and we'll see what they do with their next headset. So a lot of people have been stuck in this same kind of 90 degrees sort of region. And if you were a VR enthusiast before then, the Oculus DK1, which released in 2012, was actually the widest field of view Oculus headset ever released. So if, you're, if so, for a lot of people, they've been going on this kind of steady decrease in field of view, and a lot of people are very annoyed about that. So, you know, if you're if you're sitting there with a PC VR setup and you care about field of view, and for whatever reason you're not going for the index, the Vive Pro Two seems very compelling from that perspective. And I think businesses using the Focus Three are going to really enjoy that kind of ability to see more people in a meeting. For example, that, that's one of the kind of most underrated elements of field of view. If you're in a virtual meeting space, you don't have to constantly turn your head to see beside you, as you know we would have to at this point. Yeah. Um, just in case you weren't watching there, Hini gave a very literal definition of what he was talking about just then, as he, as he literally needed to check his notes to remember the confusing name of which headset was which. Uh, because as you uh, mentioned just then, the, there was the Focus Plus uh, which is now technically the the Focus 2. Um, and I thought that was interesting, uh, just a quick thing to talk about as well, because I mentioned this to you after it was all announced. Um, and you brought up sim the, the simple point of, well, maybe they want to call it the Focus 3 because then it's, a, you know, naming conventions-wise, it's a step ahead of the Quest 2, which I hadn't really thought about and I think is funny dirty move <laughs> samsung proved it worked samsung used to do that for years they would take the iphone number and add one and it seemed to work for them for quite a while yeah um yeah so i mean there's, there's, there's more to talk about with both of them i think it's interesting that we're seeing kind of a, a roadmap for focus free that is kind of resembling what we saw with quest 2 in some ways so we know that there's a hand tracking sdk in the works uh we know that it essentially has its own kind of link uh wired link competitor i guess you'd say or, or or alternative now um and it's also going to have uh air link although as again as hini's uh, pointed out recently that you know the older focus headsets could already stream steam games and stuff like that but this will be probably in a uh an updated version of that but it seems i i i honestly look at this the focus free and i personally feel maybe not encouraged because it's not really a relevant market to me, but I, I feel good about its, its prospects. Um, we, we mentioned Barjo earlier, um, which obviously specs wise is far and ahead of anyone else, but then at the same time, price completely reflects that too, right? It's way more expensive than any other offering out there. And I, I think if you look at the kind of, you know, HTC is very, very fond of making, showing case studies for who they've worked with, uh, companies like Audi and, and others. Um, I think this potentially has a, a pretty healthy life ahead of it, personally, for the intended market. Don't get me wrong, Ian, I, I, I know what you mean in terms of, yeah, it's probably a bit of a ripoff for what you get for your money. But businesses don't know that. Companies don't know that. And that's kind of 
you know, the play HTC's had for the past couple of years, I think. Well, yeah, there's, it's kind of, if you're marketing, if you're selling a product to a company that has a policy that requires them not using a competitor's hardware. So like Facebook is a competitor for a lot of companies more, you know, more and more with each new vertical that they go into each new product that they roll out, they're more competitor. But like, if you, uh, are, you can't use a Facebook product and you need a standalone, then your options are Pico or HTC at this point. And uh, you're going to have to investigate, put the put both those headsets on your head and try them out and whatever your purpose is, whether it's training or selling products or designing products, you're going to have to weigh a, a very different set of, uh, of goals uh, with with sort of Facebook off the table. It's just a question of when you've got a situation where Facebook is one of your options, um, that's still a, what, a $600 pricing gap or $500 pricing gap between the two options. And uh, it's just businesses are still going to be price sensitive uh, when it's, you know, a budget and, and what they can do with whether they're going to get 50 of these headsets or 100 of these headsets, uh, whatever their use case is. Um, you know, I, I just, I really wonder how long the uptake, it, how, how quickly the uptake is going to be by these businesses and the use cases for deploying them at large numbers. Uh, I found it very, I'm really curious to see what happens with Facebook's policy of giving out a free headset to every employee so we covered that on another download i think but facebook basically announced this policy where they will reimburse every single employee at facebook for a free quest 2 that's potentially fifty thousand or sixty thousand headsets it's every if every employee took it up which we know that's not going to happen but it could still be tens or ten or twenty thousand employees let's say uh, go and actually have a Quest 2 in their workplace. And I think this was pitched as one of their perks of being kind of like a, if you people are actually using Quest to work out and get fit, then you could actually um, improve your employees' wellness and keep them coming back uh, using less sick days, fewer sick days, by actually using VR headsets at home. That's beside the point, though. The other thing that it could be used for is actually going and doing your meetings in VR. And i that's the thing I'm most curious about over the long term is with persistent work from home uh, pushes from various companies, uh, are they going to give headsets out to do meet, daily meetings, doing your stand up uh, with your coworkers in VR? Like that's something our we've heard joked about and heard people talk about for years, and for various reasons, it has not been a good idea um, to sort of force your employees to spend time in VR and go into a headset to do meetings. And I, I, I don't know when that threshold gets crossed where it actually makes sense for work purposes to spend twenty or thirty minutes a day. Uh, going in there and meeting with your colleagues when 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 will we have that actually happen well i think that's one of the things that's really exciting about this headset in the fact that they put the battery in the rear that should that should mm. provide quite a significant ergonomic improvement because not only do you get the reduction in weight from the front but you get an increase to the counterbalance on the back we you know we can't say what the comfort of this headset is until we get hands on with it of course but it looks like we're not going to get there at any moment. It'll be a kind of slow, progressive change each year where you can use it for one hour and then two hours and then three hours and eventually it's to the point where you don't mind having it on all day. But I think if you look at that kind of work from home trend you're talking about and a lot of these tech companies and even kind of traditional companies talking about this, that is the market that HTC can chase for the next 10 years, even if they stay off consumer. I think there's so much room to expand in the, in the business VR case, even when it comes to businesses sending devices to employees' homes like this, that I don't think they're going to have an issue focusing, or sorry, an issue excluding the consumer market. <laughs> the BlackBerry, the BlackBerry of VR. 
I don't, yeah, I, mean, I guess that that is the one problem. You know, in tech history, the companies that try to focus specifically on businesses like this, you know, as you say, BlackBerry are eventually eaten up by the consumer option because it just gets so much better over time. Those are questions that we can only kind of see answered over the next few years, but HTC probably will have a big problem keeping up with the R&D spend of companies like Facebook, Apple, and Microsoft. That is their biggest kind of challenge. And even companies like Vario, we see a lot of innovation in these early years, but they kind of must be wondering what happens when those three big players start throwing serious R&D money at this problem themselves. Yeah. Um, the, the, getting back to the tech side of it, the, the swappable battery thing is very interesting um, for the, the reasons you brought up. I, I asked them, um, and you only get one battery <laughs> for 1,300. You don't get... Uh, uh, any of the uh, swappables. I mean, I, I guess that's uh, to be expected. The other, the other funny uh, thing on the on the price point is going back to the Pro Two. We have a article up um, that yeah, they're selling this full kit um, in August, and that's something we should talk about because that, there's some very dated tech in that kit, which we'll get to in a second. Um, but you can go out and source, kind of source these components for yourselves, what you get in the full kit, um, for cheaper than 1,400. And, and not just cheaper, you can swap out the Vive 1s, which is what I was referring to, these 2016-era designs that really haven't aged very well at all, in my opinion. You can swap them out for uh, the Valve Index controllers and still come in at either $75 left, uh, less with the uh, 2.0 base stations, or if you want to go to Vive's own store, buy the original 1.0 base stations, you can actually get them for a hundred less, which is crazy, right? Like, I can't. I going into the briefing last week, uh, I said to Heaney before then, the only thing I really want to know is if we're going to see new controllers because HTC's made new controllers. Cosmos had. Yeah, I haven't tried them myself, but I perfectly good controllers, and it's just made these for the uh, for the Focus Free as well. So, why are they still using those old controllers at such an expensive price? That's one of my like actual key, like this is a little ridiculous takeaways from this, right? These things have yeah, the to die. Right? Yeah, our commenters okay. comment, you know, are right there with you, Jamie. Uh, I saw them, several of them bring up the same thing of using those classic controllers. I, it's one of those, if it isn't broken, don't fix it. And I honestly, you know, lots of people, there's, there are people out there that love those controllers, uh, even though that like, uh, plenty of people have moved on to systems with thumbsticks because they want, they wanted those thumbsticks. It's kind of like the market, when you see these uh, analog sticks on the index controllers, there were a lot of those knuckles generations that didn't have uh, the thumbsticks mm -hmm. on them. And they only like in the last generation actually added uh, thumbsticks. And it's like they, it was Valve being hit over the head uh, by the developer and consumer community. We really, 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 really need these things. And then of course we see them on the new Sony controllers as well. And so it's, it is, pretty painful not to have those when so many people are asking for them after all these years but it's still there's plenty of people out there also that do like those things it's just i, I think it's a good example of if you look at the new controllers being uh so much like the touch and you look at the old controllers still being reused after all these years you can pretty much see the the limit to the R and D that's that's possible uh, at HCC. Yeah, I think that's a a pretty good way to look at it. Actually, and I, it's interesting because when they came out with the the Cosmos controllers, those had the light issues, right? Like at least at first, it was a light based tracking system. Um, yeah, I don't know, Heaney. What what do you think? Do you think these these controllers should have died a long time ago, or do you think Ian makes the case for their survival? Yeah, no, I, I do think HCC should have either replaced them or sort of taken them off the market. But I guess their argument is, and you know what they said to you was, you can just go and buy index controllers. And they're making the analogy of 
you know, NVIDIA doesn't have to make your CPU and your hard drive. They can just make your GPU. And HTC is kind of saying, in the PC VR space, we can be your headset and Valve can be your controllers. And isn't that fine? And, you know, I, I guess that argument isn't being made out of choice. It's more that they don't have the investment to kind of make a new lighthouse controller and go through all that. But as long as Valve can sort out the stock issues with the index controllers, and perhaps in in the next year or two come out with a revised version that fixes you know some of the minor issues with it i don't think that's the biggest issue it w- it would be better of course to be able to have this one bundle that you can buy from you know amazon or htc's website where you get the headset and the and modern controllers and base stations it would be kind of nicer psychologically but it's not the biggest deal in the world to just buy your controllers from steam and buy your headset from htc i think Mm. So Dan- Daniel asked this question, seriously, who is buying this stuff? So many headsets, such high prices. Is what businesses are using these things? <laughs> the, the best example, best answer I have for that question, it's a very good question, is uh, imagine you're building a sports car that's going to cost $150,000. And you uh, have designed the entire 3D model. It looks beautiful on the flat screen TV. But uh, then you put on a VR headset and you actually walk around the car, you lay down on the ground and you realize uh, that a mechanic can't put their arm underneath the rear uh, part of the car. And you couldn't, you couldn't realize that that was the case when you were looking at it on flat screen. And suddenly... Uh, you get this car out to market and no one wants to buy it because it's unrepairable. Those are the types of examples. I heard uh, an example very, very close to that out of NASA uh, several years ago about the HoloLens, that uh, there was some design they were doing uh, with a with a rover, and they realized they couldn't reach their arm in to like put a new part in or, or insert the device into... Uh, a rocket they like when you put it in an angle you couldn't reach a certain thing those are the types of things you can realize by actually putting a headset on and seeing the 3d model around you walking around it leaning around it sitting in the driver's seat of a car and looking at all the pieces that's that's what you get out of a vr headset and those are the types of customers that these types of headsets are going for yeah, we really can't underestimate just how important the business use cases of VR actually are. You know, we, we are very consumer focused a lot of the time mm-hmm. and we kind of care about the gaming and kind of entertainment use cases of these headsets a lot. But for companies, you have visualization, as Ian pointed out, and then you have training and collaboration. It really is those three things. So visualization, anything that you're making for the real world that is three dimensional as Ian mentioned, it's always going to make for a better product to be able to design that in a truly three-dimensional environment with VR. Then training, do you want to train people on a little 15-inch monitor in front of them, or do you want to put them in the environment that they're actually going to be in when they get to the job? And we've seen multiple studies come out to show that your brain actually finds that to be a much more effective form of training. And then the third one is obviously collaboration. If If you have a distributed team all over the world, like a lot of these big companies do, you can get a webcam grid up and talk to everyone in the little grid on your webcam, or you can put on these advanced virtual reality headsets, be sitting around a room together and pull up your designs and your latest ideas and talk about it in a virtual environment. So really the the enterprise use cases of VR are going to be huge over the next 10 years. And while these headsets are priced out of the range for a lot of consumers, most businesses would not find these prices to be too high at all, realistically, for the kind of value that it delivers. Yeah, and and to that point, uh, something to think about, um, and I guess kind of speculate and and estimate about is has the has the past year and the pandemic has that helped or damaged or has kept uh, HTC's uh, enterprise business uh, overall? Do you think? Because one 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 thing um, that Heaney will have heard in the pre-brief that I did was they kept using this. Uh, example of swappable batteries uh, in an arcade and that you could just swap it out uh, with another headset and you could, you know, get going and the user wouldn't have to really have their experience interrupted too much. And the entire time that was being explained to me, I was thinking, yeah, but who's, are we really talking about going back to VR arcades anytime soon? 
But I suppose it's uh, a give and take thing, isn't it? Because yeah, we, we've lost conventions where you saw lots of Vive Pros, not just at, again, like Keeney's saying, not just at gaming conventions, but these things are pretty popular pretty much any given adventure uh, convention. You could see a VR headset being used for one case or another. Um, but then at the same time that, you know, the pandemic has brought about more specific uses for VR as well. And does that even out? Are we on the road to recovery fast enough that uh, HTC will see recovery in the enter enterprise market? If not, do you think? Mm. So you're, you're asking if VR arcades are going to buoy uh, this business? I, I'm, I guess I'm just asking, like, where does where does enterprise VR stand after the pandemic? Because in in some ways, you know, working from home, like you were talking about with Facebook earlier on, it would have benefited from that. Location based stuff has gone away, um, and we don't. It's it's still kind of hard to predict when it will be back solidly. Uh, do those even out? How does it affect HTC or any? Mm. enterprise companies roadmap i guess is what i'm asking i know maybe that's a little too I deep it, there's two things that that I, I guess i'm thinking about uh heaney gave the examples of the markets where vr headsets are useful and none of those uh i guess training benefits from being wireless but being able to sort of communicate to someone very complex work-related ideas doesn't necessarily require wireless uh, to pull off. It makes it more convenient overall. Um, but you need the facial sensors, the lip sensors, uh, the eye sensors to be very cheap and easy to use, no calibration required. When that sort of, when that threshold is crossed, we're gonna see a dramatically different use case unlocked for businesses like that's the stuff when if you see Mark Zuckerberg on his Facebook page, he's so excited about the future and the products they're building. I, I'm becoming convinced day after day that he's got the Quest Pro prototypes in his house and he's messing with that day in and day out. Um, and you know, going to those teams and asking them what's going on. Uh, can we improve this? I, I have to be convinced that they're at that stage uh, with those sensors and facial sensors uh, really dramatically improving the social connection. Uh, the other thing, though, that I have to kind of, we've been wondering about this for a long time, Heaney, where is the co-location API? Uh, right now, you've got uh, Azure spatial anchors from Microsoft. They've got the system where you can, if you haven't seen the video, there's this amazing video that Xena put together of Jamie and I in a pair of HoloLens 2s and he's over in England, and I'm over here in America, and we have a table situated between us, and uh, we can point to the same spot on the table um, and, and have it be perfectly synced, and the spatial audio is just fantastic. That's a Microsoft, all that is Microsoft's tech with some kind of co-location API from Microsoft, but what we need is to have the arcades come back, have like two headsets from two different manufacturers, both know where the other headset is in real time space for us to have like this future where you know, the bowling mount, the bowling alley model of the 21st century, where you could go to the bowling alley with your own headset, uh, this giant open in indoor warehouse and play a game of laser tag, paintball, bowling, golf, all these different activities and you could bring your own headset or rent one of the ones from the company and have you be able to sort of go into this experience together. None of that will ever happen until we have this co-location API where the headsets can know exactly where each other, the other one is. And like when I look at Pico and uh, HTC, what they're doing up there, th their market is so limited until you've got that kind of co-location API worked out. You can't, I don't think VR arcades are going to come back with wired experiences and single player where your friends are sitting there watching you play Beat Saber or fight zombies isn't as compelling as you and three other people hiding behind walls and trying to shoot each other with paintballs. 
And like, that's the type of thing that will be unlocked as soon as that collate co-location API is, is going to be here. So it's just uh, a super long winded way of answering that it's not going to get HTC, you know, arcades aren't going to be great for a couple <laughs> of years until that stuff is there. And it's not going to be enough of a market to hold HTC. It's just, I don't want to, when I go back to the VR arcades, I don't want to see wires. Mm. Uh, can you guys still hear me? Yes. Yep. Beautiful. I just pulled out a microphone. I was worried it'd break everything, but it didn't. Um, so yeah, I guess uh, we've been we've been live for an hour now. So just wrapping up. Um, one thing that I wanted wanted to talk about was that the last time I did this with HTC, they introduced a far flung future concept called uh, Project Proton uh, that Heaney ended up writing about. Um, and the whole idea of that was it was going to be one of those, you know, kind of super slim VR headsets we've started to see come about um, on, you know, over CES. Uh, Ian, you've seen the Panasonic headset, I believe, a couple of times now. Um, it, Heaney, do you think that's still alive, that device? Or do you think it, it was, you know, it was not a one-year roadmap for that device? Do you think it's still far out in the future, but it's probably coming and probably being worked on? Yeah, I think it's one of those things, like when Facebook started showing some of their more advanced prototypes, where because of how the company presented it and kind of the expectations, people assumed it was a more near-term product than it is. What I would say is you can see some of the design language from that Proton concept come into Vive Focus 3. If you look at the rear battery, the little LED indicator, and some of the kind of design language, you can see that they're moving towards that. Yeah, if you if you... There's an image of this headset where you can see from the rear and it's very clear that it has the battery housed in there and you can see a little the, the same little LED indicator for the battery status that they had in this. So to get a headset like that, the problem is you need an advancement in lenses that isn't just widen the field of view slightly. You need to find a way of getting much more compact lenses that can magnify a smaller display over the same kind of field of view or hopefully even wider. And I still think We've seen that from Huawei in the Chinese market. We see Panasonic putting that together. But in terms of actually putting that together into a compelling product that also has all these features like we see in the standalone headsets like Vive Focus 3 and Quest 2, that's going to be a little tougher. So it's still a few years off, but I can see them kind of slowly developing their way towards it. Yeah, cool. Um, yeah, I think that's that's a good place to to wrap it up. So I'd imagine we're wrapping up at the same time as HTC, probably. Uh, the Vive Focus Free standalone headset coming later this year uh, for Enterprise and the Vive Pro 2 business and prosumo is the word uh, I think you're meant to use, like very enthusiast and uh, consumers. Uh, coming... Very, very soon, coming uh, early June as the headset, coming August as the full kit. Guys, you are tapping each other's screens. I was going to ask you if you had any closing comments on that. Was, is that related to the screen tapping? or? Uh, I was Someone was pointing out that there was feedback, and I'm wondering if it was Heaney's, uh, Heaney's streaming I, I, in the I background. Thought, no, I saw it. I, uh, I, I oh. fixed that, I think. Okay, well, aside um, from that, closing thoughts, yeah. Uh person was asking about horizon um yeah i think daniel you, you you called it the rec room copy that's still in development so uh daniel's asking about whether where is horizon from facebook that's obviously not an hcc question uh unless we want to relate it to the question of uh, will horizon run on H htc headsets and i would expect that to kind of be the case at some point if horizon is pop or if a uh, HTC's headsets are popular enough. Uh, Facebook would want them to run on on everything. Um, the the comments we heard most recently from Zuckerberg and others at Facebook uh, seem to indicate that they want Horizon to be like the creative tools in Horizon need to be up to par. Like I, it's what I I remember my first demo of Horizon. You went into this simple world where you could like resize trees and do stuff like that in VR. But then you went into a world that was made outside of VR with Unity. And it was just loads, loads, loads more interactive and more interesting. And like you were flying around a little plane and it was made in Unity. 
I don't think we're going to see Horizon launch at this point until those creative tools are up to par with what Rec Room is doing or better. And that's kind of, that's probably the bar where we'll, we won't see Horizon launch until that's there. That's, that's just my little comment there. And um, yeah, sorry. So I just wanted to respond to that commenter. And as far as HTC, um, I want them to bring down the price so desperately because I do <laughs> want these headsets in my, you know, I, I, I think the, the developers out there know uh, that, you know, uh, the Guy in this comment was like, he's not going to do a another version of virtual desktop for these headsets until there's a consumer version. Um, and that's as simple as that. Like that's, that's going to be the story for a lot of developers until you can really make a real good effort for the consumer market again. Um, the developers aren't going to be interested and then the consumers aren't going to be interested. Heaney, anything to add uh, on today's announcements just before we wrap up? Yeah, I'd say my final thoughts are that Vive Pro 2 will likely take the place of the Valve Index in the market, I think. It's going to be the new kind of PC VR, you want the best experience possible headset to pick. And I think it will actually probably do fine on its own there. I'd also point out that anyone who has an original HTC Vive or a Vive Pro from 2018, they can upgrade that for the $750 uh, pre-order price so I, I think that'll do quite well and i think the focus 3 is basically the quest pro that people have been asking for uh just not at the price that they would have wanted it for so i actually think yeah. these headsets will do better than some people expect but you can't expect a low price low margin consumer push from a small company like htc that's going to have to come from tech giants yeah uh no I, I i agree and i think that's a good uh good place to wrap up guys thanks so much for uh joining me today everyone in the comments thanks so much for being here so, thanks so much for leaving comments for us to answer uh we are normally here on mondays uh doing our tech podcast the vr download uh and on thursdays we are back with our games cast uh which will be at the time i believe will be 10 30 a.m pt uh this week i believe is when we're going to start uh, me and Zena will be here tomorrow doing another edition of VR Roulette, which is where we stream random App Lab games um, and all sorts of fun ensues. Uh, make sure to head over to UploadVR.com. We've got a bunch of great stuff going live on the website uh, this week. We should have more of our upload access on Last of Noughts, uh live today, more of that coverage. Uh, a review of Zero Caliber will be live later this week uh, and plenty more. So yeah, thanks so much for being here, everyone. And uh, we'll we'll see you later in the week.